You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. I have uh, E. Peter Greenberg, a professor at University of Washington, uh, runs the Greenberg Lab and uh, researches quorum sensing as part of bacterial communication. So, Peter, thanks for coming. How are you doing today? I'm okay. Yeah. Um, for people that don't know, what uh, first of all, what is quorum sensing? And then we'll get into some of the, the details of what you're researching. Yeah, so the brief definition of quorum sensing is the ability of an individual to sense how many of its kin are around and and an appropriate density of kin to do something cooperative. Hmm. Yeah, I've heard, uh, for instance, bacteria, when they're, you know, let's say they've entered a, a, a host, <clears throat> they'll sense the number of, uh, you know, similar strain that are around. And let's say they want to infect the host they wait until there's quote unquote enough of them and then they all act to uh, infect a host, for instance. Is that an example of quorum sensing or what are some That is an example of quorum sensing. So when an individual bacterium first invades the host, it cannot show all of its weapons until the troops have amassed, essentially. And then when there are enough bacteria to overwhelm the host's ability to respond, they sort of coordinately generate these uh, virulence factors. So how do, how do bacteria know and count their number? You know, first of all, how do they, are they releasing chemical signals that other bacteria are taking up and they're counting in that way? Like, how does it work? Yeah, that's exactly how it works. So they make these small chemicals that they secrete into their environment. It's so inexpensive to make. And if there are a few bacteria in the environment, as they make this chemical, it will diffuse away and uh, concentration will stay low. When the troops have amassed and each individual is making the molecule, its concentration will rise and all the individuals can sense the, the higher concentration of the chemical signal, the quorum sensing signal, and then respond in a coordinated fashion. And I would think there's also a directionality to the concentration. Like, you know, for um, if you have a mass of bacteria, the ones, quote unquote, in the, in the spherical middle would think the concentration is much higher than the ones on the edges. So how does the bacteria evaluate that? Yeah. So um, I don't quite know how to answer that question. You know, the, the, the um, bacteria are small creatures and as they build up a mass, they occupy a small area. And uh, because the signals are diffusible, they'll diffuse quickly away from any bacterium in the group. And um, the the concentration in some local environment, I don't know how you measure the environment, will be a constant. So in fact, the signal won't necessarily be higher in the middle of the group and on the edges. Well, what if they're in a flow environment? I don't know, uh, bacteria in your blood versus, um, you know, some quiescent part of your tissue. That would change the dynamics of the concentration gradients. Big time, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, 
the what's required to make a quorum will change under different conditions. And in a flow environment, uh, if the signal is being swept away quickly enough, then even if there are a lot of bacteria in one place, they won't know their kin are there. If, if bacteria are native to a flow environment, though, like if you have bacteria that specifically will infect someone's blood, they, I would think they would have adapted to a flow system and they would be able to measure and figure out concentration, you know, and figure out how to do quorum sensing in that kind of environment. Yeah, so um, that's not necessarily true. Bloodborne infections are interesting because the bacteria are distributed throughout the bloodstream, right? So if quorum, I guess a first point is that quorum sensing doesn't control the ability of a bacterium to cause infection in every single kind of bacterium in every case. There's there are lots of specific examples where quorum sensing is uh, affecting the virulence of bacteria, but it's not universally true. But if you have a bacteremia, blood infection, then there'll be some uh, density of bacterial cells in your bloodstream. It will be throughout the bloodstream. Um, th that's different than if, if you have um, a heart valve infection or something like that, where there's a huge flow going over bacteria that are stuck on your heart valve, then that's a different sort of situation where quorum sensing signals might in fact be swept away. So bacteria would have to have different strategies for maintaining themselves on the heart valve. Yeah, I mean, how do they know that uh, what the right threshold should be for a particular kind of uh, behavioral change? What do you think determines that and how do they sense that? Is it the rate of increase of concentration? Is it a certain threshold number? I mean, what yeah. kind of nuances have you found? Oh, there's there are a lot of nuances. <laughs> so the the first point is that uh, bacteria regulate gene expression in lots of different ways. Quorum sensing is one way. So I like to say that for genes that are controlled by these small molecules, having a sufficient quorum, a sufficient number of bacteria is necessary, but it's not sufficient. There may be other cues that the bacteria need to uh, respond to specific environments. So that's the first point. And now I'm trying to remember the second part of the question. <laughs> well, again, what, yeah, what are some of the nuances? Like you said, quorum sensing may not be the only thing that regulates uh, what yeah. they're doing, you know, gene yeah. expression, et cetera. But, but, yeah, and the other part of the question now I remember is how do they know when they're at the right density? And um, I just want to be careful here. I don't think bacteria know anything, um, but they uh, they can sense things and respond. And um, the it depends on what function they're trying to activate. And I don't think that so we work with a bacterium called Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which causes horrible chronic infections in people that are immunocompromised in one way or another. And um, form sensing mutants are impaired in their ability to cause infections. But I don't think that Pseudomonas evolved these quorum sensing systems to cause infections. So Pseudomonas controls uh, what I call public goods uh, by quorum sensing. The, the example that we study quite a bit here in the lab is the ability. So Pseudomonas can grow on proteins. These are big molecules that bacteria can't transport in and eat. And the way it does that is it secretes an enzyme called a protease that breaks down the protein to smaller bits, and then the bits okay. get transported in. They're the food. So the protease is outside the cell. Any bacteria, any bacterium in the group can share the benefit of that protease. So that's why I call it a public good. And right. it's expensive to make, and there's no value in making it at a low population density. If there are just a few bacteria in a big environment, as they make the protease, it will diffuse away from the cell. It'll break down a little bit of protein, and the cells will never get anything in return. 
So they make this proxy molecule, this small, cheap thing, and when it reaches a high enough concentration, then the bacteria are all cued to make together the protease, and then all the members of the group uh, benefit and can grow. So how do they know what density that is? They don't really. Well, I, don't, I, mean, I would think they're constantly in different environments. I mean, no environment's the same. Right. So there's got to be some recognition of, oh, this environment, I don't know, it, it has a different pH and the uh, the density of available proteins is, is different than this environment. And again, it's a flow environment or a non-flow environment. I mean, there's so many factors that would change the environment and give nuance to it. It has to be a really sophisticated mechanism by which they evaluate when to take action or not. Well, I the, the feedback. The, the, well, there is feedback. The mechanism is actually uh, sophisticated in its simplicity, right? So the system that we study, the Pseudomonas, makes these small molecules that simply diffuse in and out of cells. They don't have to be transported in or transported out. They just move in and out of cells. So the external environment, the concentration always is matching the inside of the cell. And uh, in different flow environments, so in a flow environment, it would not be useful to make a extracellular protease either. It would be swept away just like the signal. So the signals are just serving as a kind of a proxy, and they do that very simple mechanism with a an enzyme that makes the signal that can diffuse in and out of cell, and a receptor that can bind to the signal and in response, activate specific genes, gives it a lot of sophistication. So in a flow system, it will, it's measuring the sum of the signal that's made and the signal that's being swept away. It just measures the concentration of the signal. And Do you, you that, think there's any intelligence behind this? It's just a, a process that happens and either works or doesn't work? That's Yeah, I don't think there's any intelligence behind it. Well, what if the uh, whatever the timing of it, you know, if the, if the bacteria have been doing this for five minutes versus 25 minutes, when do they quote unquote give up? You know, eventually, even though it's inexpensive to make these little molecules, at some point they'll be exhausted. So what if they are at risk of starving themselves or depleting themselves because they've been sitting there for like a day doing this, pumping out the signal and nothing's happening? Yeah. So if they're running out of food, they need food to make the molecule. So um, the, the response to a lack of food will be that they'll make less molecules. So they make they make these little chemicals out of normal metabolic intermediates in their life. And if you starve them, they don't have those metabolic intermediates. So they they don't waste uh, any energy or resources making these molecules. Again, I, you know, I don't attribute any intelligent behavior to it. Um, and I don't think m many biologists would. You know, have there been experiments where they've looked at whether there's timing involved, whether the bacteria have a sense of, you know, how much time has elapsed or how much uh, molecules have been produced and they quote unquote give up before it, uh, you know, how do they know when things aren't working is what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't think they know anything. That's, <laughs> that's the point. So, so when things aren't working, they don't work, uh, and that's sort of it. Well, what would that tell you about their success rates? If they don't know anything and they're just doing this as like a mechanistic process, wouldn't that they're pretty successful. lower the success rate? No, it doesn't seem to. Hmm. I mean, are there that many environments that just happen to be conducive to them doing this, or it's just enough that, well, if uh, you know they, they they have adequate food, I mean. Again, oh, there's a piece of information the, maybe I should tell you. So um, the, the the system we work with, the, at low density, they continually make signal, but they make it at a, at a low rate. And when they finally achieve a critical mass, one of the genes that is activated is the gene for synthesis of the signal. So then... Uh, the signal concentration goes up even higher, and uh, yeah. it's more expensive to make then. And the consequence then is that if once they've committed 
to producing all of these public goods, it takes a, a fairly radical change in their environment to stop making them. Okay. So and, you... and I told you that there were multiple cues. So for proteases, for example, uh, if you grow the bacteria in a medium that has a lot of these uh, s small fragments of proteins available that they can eat without making the protease, that's a signal that dampens how much protease they make. So quorum sensing okay. says protease can do you some good. And if there's lots of products of protease around, then those products tell the bacterium not to bother making too much protease because it isn't needed. Mm. So there's mo sort of multiple, I think I started off our conversation with this point, that form sensing is necessary but not sufficient for the fine-tuning of genes that are controlled by quorum sensing. So have you tried to set up situations where you fool, you know, a, a set of bacteria, where changing school. their environment back and forth to see uh, how they respond, if they respond at all or sluggishly or, you know, in a, you know yep. can you break the machine of response? Is it pretty easy oh, to yeah. do or is it tough to do? Well, it's simple to do in the lab because with bacteria, we, you know, we know the gene responsible, genes responsible for production of the signal. We know the genes responsible for reception. So if you want to break the system, you can just make a mutation in one of those two genes and the system's broken. Uh, we and others have also developed inhibitors of quorum sensing, small molecule inhibitors, and you can break the system with those. You know, a lot of work has been done on that with the hope that maybe we'll be able to come up with small molecules that can have some therapeutic use. Oh, so if someone's sick with some kind of bacterial infection, you may be able to inject them with, you know, a small molecule drug that blocks the quorum sensing so that the bacteria stop uh, producing virulence, virulence factors? Or That's right. Factors. And, th and then they become more susceptible to our own immune system or to uh, drugs that can kill them. Yeah. Is, is that the focus of your research or what's the, the focus? No. So... Um, the the focus of my research, you know, of course, everybody's really interested in that idea. Uh, the contribution of my lab over quite a long period of time now is really to put fundamental knowledge behind all of this. So learning about what the signal generators are and how they work, what the receptors are, how they work, what genes they control in bacteria. and um, understanding sort of the sociobiology aspects of quorum sensing. So we think it controls cooperative behavior and we can gain essential information about how cooperation is maintained in populations of organisms by studying bacteria. And I have this strong conviction that if there's going to be a therapeutic, we need really good fundamental understanding of the system that we're trying to target. And I can give you an example of that. So sure. in the 1990s, we discovered that quorum sensing, by we here, I mean uh, the field as a whole, discovered that quorum sensing somehow was controlling the ability of our bacterium pseudomonas to cause infections. And we had learned that there's a sort of a two-step quorum sensing hierarchy in Pseudomonas. And if you knock out the top of the quorum sensing hierarchy in lab strains, everything gets turned off. So all of a sudden, there was a huge focus on developing small molecules that could block that uh, part of the system at the top of the hierarchy. And then later on, about 10 years later, a group here at the University of Washington studying chronic pseudomonas infections discovered that a lot of the bacteria in those infections already had mutations in that part of the hierarchy. So mm. everybody fled the field, you know, oh, this isn't going to work, and it wasn't. We 
had a fundamental interest in this and went and looked closer, and it turns out that the hierarchy is broken and the second layer of the quorum sensing system is active in all of these mutants and chronic infections. And so now there's a push again to target the second layer. That's the one that's always on, no matter what kind of infection. And um, so people are doing that, and we're continuing to try and understand how the hierarchy got broken and how it's cha- and how the circuitry has changed at a fundamental level, because we think that's going to be important to the people trying to develop therapies. And you said that the uh, in addition. Over and above and beyond quorum sensing, there's other mechanisms that uh, control bacterial behavior mm-hmm. uh, or action. What what are they? Well, so I told you um, one already that nutrient availability is a big cue for bacteria. If there are small bits of protein available in a medium, that's a signal not to make protease. Uh, temperature is a cue. So our bacterium pseudomonas only expresses certain genes. It grows at out in the environment. It's called an opportunistic pathogen. So it can live at lower temperatures than human body temperature. And one of my colleagues, Steve Laurie at Harvard University, has shown that there are specific genes in Pseudomonas that are only expressed at body temperature. So mm. in that way, it you might say it knows it's in the host. I would say <laughs> that that's a cue for it to do certain things. Huh. So there's and all kinds the of yeah. the mechanism for that. So um, as I understand it, this isn't my area, but there are regions of messenger RNA, the, the molecule that's translated into the protein workhorses of the cell that have secondary structures and those secondary structures are sensitive to temperature fluctuations. So at a lower temperature, there might be a secondary structure that blocks the ability for the messenger to be translated. And when you raise the temperature, that secondary structure will melt away and open up the message so that it can be translated. You said that um, some of the, the genes involved in quorum sensing, uh, they may have so many mutations, so the, the population of bacteria is, I guess, heterogeneous, and just knocking out one particular gene won't work because it's it's different, and it would be impossible to knock it out in mass. Well, I think what we need to do is find one particular gene that is essential. That's always been the strategy for developing antibiotics, because you find target a gene that's essential for the ability of the bacteria to grow, and you make a small molecule that interacts with that protein and blocks its function, and that disarms the bacteria. Now, the idea of quorum sensing inhibitors is a little bit different because bacteria only need quorum sensing under certain situations. So we wouldn't say that the genes for quorum sensing are essential genes, but what we want to know is whether any of them are essential in certain uh, disease situations. Well, what about uh, antibiotic resistance? Do, you know, what, the mechanism of that, I would think, is uh, bacteria very quickly rearranging their genes, exchanging genetic information, and uh, mutating, if you like, super mm-hmm. quickly on the order of sometimes 15, 20 minutes. So is that happening when, uh, you know, all that could be completely changing the landscape, and therefore it may be impossible to find a gene that is responsible for uh, for what you're looking for. Yeah, well, I, so bacteria um, don't mutate within 15 or 20 minutes. If you if you treat an infection with an antibiotic, there can there are huge numbers of bacteria in that infection, you know, hundreds of millions of bacteria. And if one of those hundreds of mi- millions has some sort of mutation, then that renders it uh, insensitive to the antibiotic. There can be a lot of reasons for that. Maybe it blocks the uptake of the antibiotic or whatever protein the antibiotic targets has changed just a little bit so that the antibiotic can't bind to it. 
if there's just one in those hundreds of millions of bacteria and you kill off all the other ones, then it will emerge and grow up and take over. So um, they're always there, and the antibiotic puts on a selective pressure. Um, and that's a tough one to deal with. Uh, that uh, The other issue, again, this isn't my area of specialty antibiotic resistance, but the other problem is that um, antibiotic resistance can spread through a population. So um, bacteria can transfer genes from one to another. So that can sort of increase the rate at which the antibiotic resistant bacterium can take over. So that would mean communication between bacteria. Does that mean communication? Well, I, it depends on, I, not by my definition of communication. So, um, you know, I, I mean, wouldn't a bacteria say, help me, I'm I'm dying? And another bacteria says, here, take this gene. I don't it, think they I'm do okay. that. <laughs> what do you, how do you think it happens then? How does it spread throughout a population? Yeah, I think if bacteria are close enough so that genes, the, there are um, sort of natural ways that genes can be moved around in populations of bacteria. There are several different ways. Viruses can infect bacteria. and when they uh, leave the bacterium, either by growing up and uh, killing that bacterial cell. Sometimes they take little bits of bacterial DNA with them, and if they infect another bacterium, most of the time the bacterium that's infected will be killed, but sometimes the DNA that's carried with the, the virus will confer antibiotic resistance to the new bacterium. When bacteria are killed by antibiotics, they they pop, or at least with some antibiotics, and their DNA is released into the environment. And some bacteria have a natural ability to take up DNA in their environment. And if they take up that piece of DNA that may be coded for an ability to resist one antibiotic or another, they can become antibiotic resistant. So again, you know, I don't, I don't um, really think about it as if a bacterium has some sort of knowledge that it's going to benefit by taking something up. Okay. <laughs> so, so with um, so quorum sensing again is is your focus. What uh, are you trying to specifically knock out different genes to see what will uh, will stop it? you know, for Pseudomonas, for instance, or what, what is like your very specific focus right now? Yeah, so lately, uh, um, we have some broad general areas that we're working on, but one of the things that I find most interesting right now is um, understanding how quorum sensing benefits bacteria. So I told you that my view is that it enables a sort of efficient way to control cooperation. Don't make things for cooperation when you don't have any friends to cooperate with around. And cooperation is a sort of a evolutionary enigma. Um, that I, I explained to you how in groups of Pseudomonas all making protease, all the individuals in the population benefit from the collective production of the protease. If there's a mutant in there that doesn't make the protease, it still benefits, right? Mm -hmm. And um, we call those cheat cheaters. And uh, evolutionary theory says that uh, it should be more fit than the cooperators because it doesn't pay the cost of cooperation. And if it's more fit, it should survive and take over. But we know cooperation exists in nature. And we're un trying to understand at a molecular level what the rules are that stabilize cooperation. If you throw a cheater into a group of pseudomonas cells, they have an ability to restrain it from taking over. So we well, think that ha has important implications for disease, for disease control as well. <clears throat> so there's no intent behind restraining cheaters. It's just beneficial supposedly to the population there's no sense right. of 
itself and bacteria and other, and that's why the cooperation occurs. Yeah, the cooperation occurs because in terms of evolution, it provides a benefit to the group. If they didn't cooperate, nobody would gain an advantage, right? Cooperation is required for them to grow on protein. Um, and when we grow them on proteins, cheaters do emerge. And the question is why, after they emerge, don't they completely take over and cause the population to crash? They don't. And so we've begun to understand some of the sort of genetic basis that allows cooperators to control cheaters. Again, I guess no, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me why they would be a cheater and why they would be a cooperator if they didn't have a sense of self and other. Why would they be different behaviors? Why would it, you know? Yeah, so quorum sensing, I'll give you an example. Quorum sensing in Pseudomonas activates the expression of a couple of hundred genes. And hmm. one of those genes codes for the enzyme that breaks down protein ex extracellularly. Another uh, codes for the ability of the bacteria to make cyanide, a poison. And, an, and then a third one codes for the ability of the bacteria to grow in the presence of cyanide. So cooperators make cyanide and they become impervious to cyanide. And so if a cheater comes up in the environment, it doesn't make cyanide, it can't it doesn't respond to the quorum sensing signal. So it doesn't make cyanide itself. And it also doesn't make the gene that enables it to be, that doesn't make the protein that enables it to be resistant to cyanide. So the cooperators um, impair the growth of the cheaters. Mm -hmm. And this is just sort of hardwired hard into the bacterial genetic regulatory systems. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. See, I don't think so anybody's what, thinking about it. What do you mean you don't oh, think go ahead. thinking about it? Any bacteria are thinking about it. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. So what would be uh, you know, a fantastic result that you'd be excited about if you could achieve it in the next few years? Oh, that's a good question. So uh, we've all been become fascinated by the second layer of the quorum sensing system in Pseudomonas. And... Uh, that's the one that is maintained in bacteria during infections. And it's somehow the bacteria, if they have to, <clears throat> will rewire their quorum sensing system so that works even in, in the absence of the system on the top of the hierarchy. And there are a lot of things we don't know about that second system. So we don't know what genes are specifically controlled by that system and not by the other one. And we think some of those genes must be important for infection. So we want to find out what those genes are. For some reason, the receptor for the signal of that second system has really been difficult to study in the laboratory. And a big result would be to develop methods to do that. And our lab is working on that, and I know a couple other labs are working on that. Uh, so that would be important for a lot of reasons. Then we can understand how it works, what it, there are some quirks about how it works compared to other similar um, proteins, and we'd be able to more easily develop strong inhibitors and test them out in animal models of infection. So that would be, uh, I think, a big result hmm. okay so yeah, very good i mean that's for now it's uh that's all my questions so what's the best way for people that want to learn more to uh you know read over the research get in touch with the lab or you yeah well i they can get in touch with the lab they can send an email to me and i usually respond unless you get billions of listeners and mm. uh, um, <laughs> uh there are Good short reviews to write, to read, you know, depending on your uh, scientific literacy. We wrote a review that came out about a year and a half ago, was published in Nature magazine uh, that one could read. And a couple years before that, a review in a journal called Annual Reviews of Microbiology that really talked about the 
social aspects of quorum sensing and, and about how quorum sensing is controlling bacterial social activities. Okay. Any other ways to get in contact, or is that good? That's sufficient? Uh, yeah, I think that, you know, if people want to get in contact with me, the best way to get in contact is to write me. Yeah, send me an email. Okay. That's great. Well, all right. Well, Peter, thank you for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Sure. It's been my pleasure. You asked me some interesting questions. Good job. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.